The U.S. Marines, along with NATO forces and Afghan troops, have launched this uh, major offensive into Helmand province in Afghanistan. What's the significance of this? Well, it means that Afghanistan is going to be increasingly in the headlines as opposed to Iraq. Uh, the United States is getting closer to a thousand troops getting killed on the ground in Afghanistan. You're going to see more criticism as a consequence, but uh, very little significant progress. You have so many fewer troops than you'd actually need to really start shoring up uh, both political stability and governance in that country. Uh, we're beginning what's going to be increasingly a very difficult foreign policy period for one of the first crises that President Obama is going to have on his watch. And Garrick, as I watch this, I, I harken back to strategy that was used in Vietnam, which was mm -hmm. go in, combat the enemy, mm -hmm. and then withdraw. And then, of course, the problem was the Viet Cong came back. Precisely. You go in, you occupy, and you put the lid on the situation. But in Afghanistan, you've got the mountains, you've got the valleys. Uh, there's no way you're going to be able to do this with 40, 50, 70,000 troops. But I think the key uh, aspect of this is what Ian was saying is this is where President Obama, who talked about the importance of Afghanistan in the campaign, the critical importance of that country and along with Pakistan, with his new military commanders there, has staked the flag without any talk, understandably, of an exit strategy or an exit date. So this is open-ended. Uh, we used to talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I don't know whether Afghanistan's a tunnel, but it's going to go and twist and turn for a long time. Well, let's turn to Iraq, because the big news of the week mm -hmm. there was, of course, the pullback of U.S. forces inside of that country, withdrawing to bases. What I'm wondering is, did we, did meaning the media, did the politicians make too much of this? There are still 130,000 American troops there. They are still potentially very much in harm's way. We have a lot of people there who are acting as trainers, um, and they're out there with the Iraqi forces. Did we make too much of it? Is this as big a milestone as we pretend? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, it, it by itself is not such a big milestone, and neither is the full withdrawal of American forces that will maintain 50,000 on the ground, which we'll also, I'm sure, make a meal of. But Iraq is moving from a situation where it's all about geopolitical risk and there's huge amounts of conflict and will the government stay together to one where we're talking of policy risk. CEOs are actually traveling to Baghdad now and yes they're wearing flak jackets but they're talking about setting up offices and investing. A middle class is developing and feeling more consolidated and they're thinking wow we just had really bad elections in Iran. Not sure how much influence we want that country to have on our own political process. So it is the right time to start talking about the consolidation of the political process, even though perhaps these aren't the right headlines to be drawing the attention to. I think the pullback was very significant because although the troops may still be there in some base on the edge of town or outside the towns and the cities, the fact is uh, they're not in the towns and the cities. And if all hell were to break loose, pardon the expression, then would the Americans go back and intervene? You say quite rightly, they could, they could. But that would put paid uh, to the idea of an exit strategy, which is supposed to be a continuous process. So for President Obama, who said again uh, that his exit strategy is to get out of uh, whatever today's equivalent of peace with honor is going to be and some stability, I think it's a very important move because I find it very difficult for him to send American combat troops back in. Are you optimistic that this level of violence, this uptick as it was described, will subside or are we really fearful that sectarian violence is once more rearing its ugly head? Um, I, I think you are, are always going to see a level of sectarian violence uh, until you have Iraqi troops on the ground that are truly working at international level with the numbers and the resources, and we're still many years away from that. But I don't believe that this is the beginning of a broad-scale deterioration um, of Iraqi stability. I think the political process is in place. We're going to continue to have elections. The Sunnis and the Shia are actually starting to work together. We're seeing more intra-sectarian fighting than we're seeing actually amongst uh, these groups. And I think, again, from a very low base, there are reasons to feel, start to feel optimistic. Let's move on to Honduras. This was a story that blossomed last weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a president, uh, that is Manuel Zelaya, uh, who was removed from office um, by the military of that country. And now the United States has come to the forefront in the drive to get him back. Why do we care? Why are we well, doing it? First of all, as we all know, this uh, half a smile 
shouldn't smile about this at all. This is a story from the past. We thought coup d'etats in Central America or Latin America were part of ancient history, or at least not in the last 15, 20 years. But suddenly we wake up one day, and he wakes up in his pajamas and is hustled out of the country. As Ian was saying earlier, when you go to bed, you've got to be careful what you're wearing in bed, because uh, the photographers will greet you in your pajamas the next day. I think I'm it's very... I'm just saying that to you, Gary. Yeah, I, I, just think, I just think, yes, thank you very much. I think it's very important uh, that the Obama administration acted immediately the way it's doing. But beyond that, it's not just the United Nations, which passed a resolution, but the Organization of American States. There's a solid, rapid, unequivocal response saying, we're not going to tolerate this, period. But the president was trying to do something that went against the constitution of his own country. That's right. And I think we need to recognize this. Everyone is talking about this as being a coup by the military. But the reality is that there were elections coming up in January. Zelaya did not want to step down. He wanted to have a referendum that would allow, uh, a la Bloomberg, uh, for term limits to be gotten rid of. And the Supreme Court and the Congress of that country had ruled that that was not going to be allowed. And Zelaya said, I'm doing it anyway. So there's a very serious argument to be made here that Zelaya engaged in a coup, a soft coup, and the military and the political elites and the business elites and the major institutions of that country said sorry. So checks and balances kind of worked in Honduras. So even though we don't like the fellow per se, it is, I guess, the, the, the notion, the premise here. We stand up for democracy. We stand up for democracy, but it's more than just standing up for democracy and freedom because, again, it's more than just the U.S. It is the entire continent, North and South America, coming together and saying, this has to be relegated to the past. We're not going to tolerate this because if it's allowed here, it's going to happen elsewhere, and we don't want to go back to those days. That's the step that's being taken by the U.S. and others. Got to end it there. Gary Cutley, Ian Bremmer, nice to see you both. Thank you. Thank you.